One day, something really unexpected happened to me. It all began when I took my husband to the doctor for a regular checkup. We thought it would be just a normal visit, but it turned out to be a big shock. The doctor, Dr. Lawrence, looked very serious and told us some scary news about my husband's health. His serious face made it clear this was serious. I felt really scared and couldn't believe what I was hearing. The person I loved and took care of was now causing me worry and fear. Dr. Lawrence told me I should think about my own safety and maybe stay away from my husband for a while. His words made me feel really overwhelmed and afraid. My name is Betty Frieden and I'm 50 years old. I spent the last 10 years working at a big company that makes medicine. That place feels like a second home to me, giving me comfort and making me feel like I belong there. Even though I'm older, I've kept working full-time and earned respect from my coworkers. Not many people my age still work full-time, but I've always been okay with it. Part of the reason I'm so dedicated to my job is because I didn't get married until four years ago. My boss Gerald and I are close because we're both single. Once, he jokingly asked me if I was ever going to get married, but I knew he was just teasing. Around that time, I was seeing Richard secretly. He's older than me, was married before, and like me, doesn't want kids. We met through a service that helps people find companionship later in life. We decided to keep our marriage quiet, not telling anyone about our plans. Even though our boss made jokes about us getting married, eventually Richard and I got married quietly without any big ceremony, just signing papers at City Hall. It was simpler than I expected, but I was excited about our future together. When Dr. Lawrence gave me scary advice, I had to rethink everything. My feelings of care for my sick husband were now mixed with fear and confusion. Dr. Lawrence's words kept echoing in my head, telling me I needed to act to keep myself safe. As I stood there trying to understand what was happening, I realized I had to make a decision quickly. Suddenly, the life I knew and the plans I had were uncertain. I'm in La and my husband Richard works at a factory. Honestly, I make more money than he does. Richard started working at the factory right after high school. I grew up in an orphanage and always wanted to be independent. That's why I didn't want to quit my job at the pharmaceutical company even after we got married. I love my job too much. When Richard and I got married, I told my boss, Gerald, right away. He congratulated me, but I could tell he felt a little sad. Maybe he was lonely because his friend, who was also single, got married first. I tried joking with him about it, but he didn't seem to want to talk about it, so I dropped it. Even though Gerald's reaction was a bit strange, I was really happy to start this new part of my life with Richard. I imagined all the great things we would do together, but real life wasn't as exciting as my dreams. Being newlyweds was pretty normal, not much changed for me. I kept working, and the biggest difference was moving to a quieter area and driving to work instead of taking the bus. Richard and I shared my old car because he didn't have one. About a year after we got married, things started to go wrong. Richard began acting differently. He didn't seem himself. He barely touched his breakfast, seemed lost in his thoughts, and even mixed up simple things like condiments. His clothes didn't match, and he became quieter both at work and at home. While I've always admired Richard's quiet strength, his silence started to weigh heavily on me, making me feel like I was all alone. This feeling of loneliness grew as I noticed these small but important changes in him. It hit me that Richard might be going through a mental health problem. Seeing someone you love struggle without knowing how to help them is really tough. So I decided to take Richard to a special clinic that helps with both mental and physical health. There he was diagnosed with depression. I knew a bit about depression, but hearing the official diagnosis made everything seem a bit darker. The doctor explained that the best way to deal with depression is to figure out what's causing it and tackle that directly. But finding out what exactly was making Richard depressed was hard. He'd been working at the same factory for years without any problems, and nothing big had changed at his job. I even worried that maybe our marriage was somehow making him feel this way. 
As we talked with the doctor, I reassured him that Richard and I were living a happy life together, and we couldn't pinpoint any specific problems at home that might have caused Richard's depression. The doctor told us to come back if anything changed or if we figured out what might be causing his depression. But even after visiting the clinic multiple times, we couldn't find out why Richard was feeling so down. As time went on, his depression only got worse. On his worst days, he could hardly get out of bed, often had headaches, and sometimes had to call in sick to work. He lost his appetite and a noticeable amount of weight. Eventually, he had to quit his job because he couldn't keep up anymore. Richard felt really guilty for relying on me financially, but I assured him that I was okay with working. My main concern was his health. It was really hard to see him suffering so much, and I was always worried about him. Once, when I was at work, Richard went out and got lost on his way back home. That made me worry even more because I wondered if he was not just dealing with depression, but maybe even dementia. That thought added to my stress. When my coworker asked how things were going, I had to admit that Richard wasn't getting better. It's really tough to watch someone you love struggle so much without being able to help them. One day, Gerald, my boss, noticed that I looked really tired and gave me an energy drink. It made me feel a little better, and I was touched by his kindness. He reminded me that we're all in this together, and his words almost made me cry. With everything going on with Richard, I hadn't realized how much stress I was under. It became clear that I needed to take care of myself too, or else I might fall apart. So I threw myself into my work, trying to keep things as normal as possible in our lives. A year had gone by, but things hadn't gotten any better for Richard. If anything, they had gotten worse. As our third wedding anniversary approached, I couldn't see any improvement in his condition. Then, one morning, I realized our car was missing. I checked again, but it was definitely gone. Since Richard's diagnosis, I was the only one who drove it, and I hadn't used it since the day before, so it should have been at home. I asked Richard if he knew where the car might be. He said he thought it was there when he got home yesterday. I remembered he had gone out for a bit while I was at work. The doctor had suggested he try walking or jogging to help him cope. If the car was there when he came back, it must have disappeared during the night. With the car gone, I had to use public transport and ended up being about 10 minutes late for work. I explained the situation to Gerald, my boss, who was understanding but curious about the car's disappearance. He wondered if Richard might have taken it, but I didn't think so. Given Richard's condition and his reluctance to drive since getting sick, it didn't seem likely. Despite Richard's memory lapses and mood swings, I couldn't imagine him being responsible for the missing car. The car mystery just added another layer of complication to our already tough situation. Right after realizing the car was gone, I reported it to the police hoping it would turn up soon. But deep down, I worried it might be gone for good. And if that wasn't enough, something else strange happened. On payday, I went to the bank to withdraw some money and found that my personal account was empty. I was shocked. We had a joint account, which I checked next, only to find it was also empty. This left me completely puzzled. Richard and I shared the joint account, but he didn't have access to my personal account and he didn't know its PIN. Yet somehow, all our savings had disappeared. It hit me hard. When I got home, I confronted Richard about it. I asked him if he knew anything about the money missing from our joint account. He seemed genuinely puzzled and said he didn't know anything about it. Because of his depression, I was hesitant to push him further, worried it might make things worse for him. Richard was staring at the ceiling, looking distant like he often did when he was lost in his thoughts because of his condition. It made me wonder if he could have taken the money, but I wasn't sure. Planning to talk to the police about it, I felt overwhelmed by losing both our car and our savings. The financial strain was tough, especially since I didn't have a family to lean on for support. Growing up in an orphanage, I didn't have parents to help me out in tough times, 
With Richard's condition not improving, it was suggested that we move into a bigger hospital with more resources than the small clinic we'd been going to. The clinic had done what they could, but they thought a general hospital could give him better care. They even gave us a referral letter. So we decided to go to the general hospital. For the first time taking Richard, there was a bit nerve-wracking for me. Richard stayed quiet throughout the journey, lost in his own thoughts, as we arrived at the hospital. I took a deep breath, preparing for whatever might come next. I walked into the hospital and handed over the referral letter at the reception, expecting to wait a while since it was a busy place. The lobby was full of patients, each waiting for their turn. After about an hour, Richard was finally called in for his consultation. While he went inside, I took out a book to pass the time. Before Richard had even settled into the doctor's office, a nurse came up to me. "'Excuse me, are you Mrs. Simmons?' she asked. I said yes, and she told me the doctor wanted to see me. Since I was used to discussing Richard's condition, I figured it was something similar this time. I followed her to another room, feeling a bit anxious. There I met a doctor who looked a bit older than me, with gray hair and a kind manner. Before I could even sit down properly, I asked if this was about Richard's condition. He nodded seriously, and I braced myself for whatever news he had for me. The doctor's next words caught me completely off guard. He told me that Richard had been arrested for fraud ten years ago and advised me to keep my distance from him. I was utterly confused. Why was this coming up now during a routine medical visit? The doctor explained that he suspected Richard might be faking his depression. He remembered treating a deep cut on Richard's leg during surgery ten years ago, which raised his doubts. This revelation shocked me. I thought we were dealing with Richard's mental health, but now I was learning about his hidden past and a possible deception about his current condition. It was a lot to process, and I struggled to reconcile the caring husband I knew with the person the doctor described. When the doctor mentioned recognizing a large scar on Richard's right leg, it all started to make sense. I knew of the scar but didn't know how Richard got it, as he had never mentioned it. Finding out that the doctor before me was the one who had treated Richard's injury years ago felt like an unbelievable twist of fate. As the doctor continued, he revealed more about Richard's past. Richard had injured himself during a dispute with his ex-wife, which stemmed from him stealing her money and luxury items. Shockingly, he had even pretended to have dementia to lower his ex-wife's guard before committing the fraud. This pattern of faking illnesses to aid his deceit was truly disturbing. Learning about Richard's criminal history and arrest was overwhelming. I hadn't looked into his background before marrying him. Having been alone for most of my life, I was just grateful to find someone who wanted to be with me. The doctor's serious warning that Richard could be a danger to me sent shivers down my spine. His tone made it clear that this was a serious situation. It hit me hard. I had been deceived. In the days that followed, I struggled to act normal around Richard while secretly planning my next moves. I decided to install surveillance cameras around our home to monitor Richard's actions when I wasn't there. About a week later, I noticed a watch and bag were missing. When I reviewed the camera footage, I saw Richard leaving the house with them and returning later with a lot of cash, looking pleased with himself. His behavior didn't match that of someone suffering from depression. This footage confirmed my worst fears. Richard was the one behind the theft of my belongings, the car, and our savings. Seeing hard evidence of his deceit was heartbreaking. Richard had lied to me and manipulated me, betraying the trust I had in him. It was clear that I needed to take serious action against someone who had pretended to be vulnerable and in need of care only to take advantage of my kindness and generosity. The realization that Richard had betrayed my trust was unbearable. I had dedicated my life to working and caring for what I thought was a sick partner. The idea of getting a divorce seemed too small compared to the immense deception I had experienced. It was clear we needed to go our separate ways, 
but I wanted more than just a legal separation. I wanted Richard to truly grasp the seriousness of his actions and to make amends for the harm he had caused. With a heavy heart and tears threatening to spill, I gathered the divorce papers and filled them out meticulously, including all the necessary details. The following day, pretending everything was normal, I told Richard I needed to step out for a moment. I had already arranged to take a day off from work, explaining the urgency of my situation to my employer, who had agreed to my sudden absence. At the police station, I presented my case to the officers, showing them the footage I had captured of Richard's deceit. At first, they were hesitant to take action based solely on the video. However, after checking with the pawn shop where Richard had sold the stolen items and finding my car being sold as used, the evidence against him started to pile up. They also confirmed that he had accessed my bank accounts illegally and suspicions arose about his supposed depression. As the truth came out, I felt a mix of relief and sadness. Given Richard's criminal history, the police decided to act quickly and prepare to arrest him. When we returned home with the officers in the early afternoon, Richard looked surprised to see me and even more shocked by the police presence. Despite the divorce papers I held, his focus was on the officers as they informed him of his arrest for fraud. Richard protested, trying to use his depression as a defense, but I wasn't fooled. The doctor from the general hospital had already cast doubt on Richard's claims about his mental health. In that moment, facing the consequences of his actions and the end of our marriage, Richard's mask started to slip. Deciding to take legal action was tough, but it was necessary to protect myself and seek justice for the betrayal I had experienced. During my recent visit to the hospital, a doctor recognized Richard from his past deceitful behavior. He revealed that Richard had once pretended to have dementia to deceive his ex-wife, which made me question his current claims of depression even more. Despite the serious accusations against him, Richard remained unfazed in front of the police, casually denying everything. It was almost as if his history of deceit had prepared him for this moment. He showed no signs of guilt or remorse, instead challenging us to provide proof of his fraudulent actions. His boldness was shocking, especially with the police ready to arrest him based on solid evidence. It was clear that he was accustomed to manipulating situations and underestimating their seriousness. For four years he had deceived me, taking advantage of my trust to steal from me and exploit my kindness. Yet, in a twisted attempt to shift blame, Richard suggested that it was my fault for being too trusting, which felt like another insult. His audacity was astounding. I had supported him, hoping for his recovery, only to be betrayed and treated with disdain. At that moment, I lost my patience. I declared my intention to seek legal advice and pursue alimony, urging Richard to face the consequences of his actions. My outburst at the police station surprised everyone, including the officers, but it finally seemed to shake Richard's composure. As the police handcuffed him, his defiance crumbled. He looked defeated, his arrogance replaced with frustration as he was led away. Watching the scene unfold, I felt detached, as if I were watching someone else's life unravel. Ever since the doctor's warning, nothing had seemed real anymore. Yet here I was, confronted with the harsh reality of my situation, determined to move forward from the chaos Richard had caused. Watching Richard being taken away by the police felt surreal, almost like a scene from a dream. This moment marked a turning point, allowing me to imagine a return to the life I had before the chaos of marriage consumed it. As a sense of relief washed over me, knowing I wouldn't spend my future under Richard's manipulative control, I also felt a wave of loneliness. Waiting more than 47 years to marry, the idea of being alone once again overshadowed my newfound freedom. Two months later, our divorce was finalized. Richard's arrest had caused a slight delay in the process, but by the time everything was official, my emotions had settled. I was able to reflect on our shared history with a clear mind. Richard's future was uncertain, facing imprisonment for his second offense. 
I could only hope that this experience would lead him to sincerely reconsider his choices. In the aftermath of our dissolved marriage, which had become nothing more than a disillusioning memory, I found myself contemplating my next steps over a simple lunch at work. It was then that my boss, Gerald, approached me with his store-bought hot dog lunch and made a seemingly casual yet loaded comment. I think you'd be just fine if you were with me, he said, almost offhandedly. His words caught me off guard, and it took a moment for their full weight to sink in, leaving me momentarily flustered. Yes, I'm serious, he added, noticing my hesitation. His tone was smooth yet sincere. I was speechless momentarily forgetting about my lunch as I processed his proposition. Gerald then went back to work, leaving me to contemplate his unexpected offer. In the days that followed, the idea of a romantic relationship with Gerald had never crossed my mind, yet I couldn't ignore the care and stability he had always shown me. His steady presence and responsible nature suddenly made me see him in a new light. Despite my initial reaction, as I continued to eat and ponder, the seeds of possibility that Gerald had planted began to take root in my mind, suggesting a future I hadn't dared to imagine until now. The idea of inviting Gerald out for a meal after work sparked a warmth within me. It kindled a sense of hope for the future. Perhaps this was the perfect moment to embark on a new journey, to explore the possibility of happiness and companionship once again. The thought of stepping out of my comfort zone and into a new beginning with someone who had shown me kindness and support felt both thrilling and comforting. Tonight, I decided it could be the start of